Hello and welcome to this episode of Self Made. I'm your host, D. Brown, CEO. Joining me on the show today is Dr. Stephen Bloomberg. Dr. Bloomberg is the president of Southeast Arkansas College in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Dr. Bloomberg, welcome to the show. D, thank you so much for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So I want to jump right into it. And I want to just to set the stage for the viewers, I want to just understand your journey to becoming the president of CARC. And so take me back to your childhood. Where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? So, D, I, I had an interesting childhood. I guess we all have interesting childhoods, but but I was adopted at two months old. Um, I lived with my parents in a city called Ogallala, Nebraska, which is in the western panhandle of, of Nebraska. Left when I was 17 years old after graduating from high school, moved to Southern California, um, partly because, D, at that time, I didn't know what what I wanted to do. Um, I was a first generation college student when I finally did go to college. Um, my parents, interestingly enough, I didn't find out they didn't graduate from high school and D didn't find out until I was an adult because my mom and dad didn't want me to be ashamed of the people that they were. But D, they were still are some of the most hardest working, um, dedicated people and, and have had such a positive impact on on my life. So. Um, went to Southern California, um, attended various colleges, finally got on track, earned my bachelor's degree, and then I started working at a community college in, in California. And D, that's when I really started to, to think about what I wanted to do for a career. Certainly growing up, I would have never imagined becoming a college president, but I was so fortunate to have a president become my mentor and really my second father and, and helped me understand the value of higher education uh, helped me understand the opportunities that we have today as community colleges to really empower students and change their lives. And so um, it really started with a mentor who helped me understand what it meant to be a person in a position to help others, not just be a president for simply the title and the sake of. Right. And so just I want to just backtrack just a little bit, bit and go back to your childhood. So, uh, Adopted at two months old, uh, what were some of the challenges you faced as a, as a child growing up in a small town in uh, Nebraska? I, I think the main challenge for me was is that I have a mixed race background. And so I grew up in an environment of, of primarily Caucasians. And for me, things were just different because in many cases I, I looked different and um, the things that, that, that I valued weren't necessarily shared by, by others. And so, you know, when I, I went to school, I experienced bullying. Um, I experienced people who were not very tolerant of the way I looked and the, the way I dressed, the way my hair was. D, that was hard because as a kid, I think, you know, we all want to try to fit in. We want to be like other kids. And right. sometimes we don't realize that it's okay to be ourselves. And so there was a time in junior high particularly, so I'm old enough that it wasn't middle school, right? It was junior high. There was a time where that was that was transitional. It was it was traumatic. But D, out of that, the one thing I decided was I was going to be who I was as a person and I was going to persevere. And so got into high school, played athletics, got, got – uh, um, fairly good grades. But, you know, D, it was a struggle because, again, I didn't I didn't look like everybody else. And, and again, the things that that were were important to me weren't necessarily important to everyone. Right. So when did you find out that you were adopted? I knew that when I was younger, so probably less than 10 years old, I knew from my parents that I had been adopted. And and for me, I've never had a desire to, to find um, my birth family, I know many people who are adopted uh, attempt to find their roots, but the parents that I have are my parents. They will always be my parents and they they sacrifice so much for me. And so I, I, I uh, never decided that I wanted to go back and look at, at where I came from. But I knew uh, the when I was less than 10 years old. OK, so uh, you're in college, uh, you're you're involved with athletics. So when do you make the decision that you're going to go to college and further your education? And what was that transition like? So when I left Nebraska, I moved to Southern California, didn't have a plan. And, and the reason I moved there is because I wanted to get as far away from where I grew up as I could. 
and and again as a first generation college student um i didn't have anybody in my life that that taught me for lack of a better term how to college how to go to college how to apply for financial aid how to apply for admissions i remember going my senior year to some colleges and and doing some tours and d I had no idea how you paid for college. I just knew that my family and I couldn't do it. So I just presumed that just wasn't something for me. So I moved to Southern California um, again, just because I felt like I wanted to be somewhere where there were people who were like me. And and I, I credit those experiences when I was 20, 21, 22 years old to really molding me into the person that I am today. And so um working construction jobs. I also figured out pretty quickly that that's probably not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so that really helped me get into community college. And thankfully at the time in California, um, if you were a resident, the tuition and fees uh, for 10 units, uh, what we call credit hours today, yeah. was capped at $50. And oh, so wow. this is back in the mid eighties. And so D, that was honestly my on-ramp to higher education is because that made college affordable for someone like me who had absolutely no idea how it was going to happen any other way. Right. And so when do you, I know you are uh, a former economic developer, probably even in your role as president of CRC, you still serve in that capacity trying to grow uh, the university. So uh, where did you develop a passion for economic development and what was your first role in that in that arena? When I served at a community college in, in Texas, I became intimately involved in, in what we would call workforce development. So that's really preparing a skilled labor force for area business and industry. And so I got the opportunity to work with Fortune 100 companies, ConocoPhillips, Chevron Phillips, uh, uh, Valero, other companies like that to help train their workforce. And, and so, D, the further I got into it, I'm like, this is this is a great opportunity. So I actually transitioned from being a dean of workforce development to being the chief executive officer of the Borger Texas Economic Development Corporation, um, that gave me an opportunity to engage in economic development on a much higher scale, not just training workforce, but honestly retaining and growing local employers and bringing in new employers from the outside. And so back in 2003, we actually landed a $90 million manufacturing facility in today's dollars, that's probably over $150 million investment. But that was such a great time because we were competing against four domestic sites and three foreign sites. And uh, we were able to convince the, the company that, that uh, our place was better than anybody else because we did have a trained workforce. We had a commitment to helping businesses grow and that economic development experience, you're, you're right, has played a critical role as a college president because not only do we engage in workforce development, but we're a regional catalyst for economic development as well. So my time in, in Texas really gave me a great overview of how powerful economic development opportunities can be to transform a community. So when did you develop a passion for community colleges and kind of share with my guests why community colleges are so important? Honestly, if there was not a community college in my life, D, I wouldn't be with you today. So my first opportunity to enroll in, in higher education was at a community college in California. And so that gave me a chance to experience higher education. And, and I think the importance of community colleges today is, I know this may sound over-dramatized, but many times, for students, their choice is either a community college or nothing. And that means that for whatever reason, maybe their, their, their families didn't give them an opportunity to learn about colleges when they were growing up. Maybe they didn't have the resources. Um, we're the gateway, meaning community colleges, for so many great careers. And, and D, I think there's a movement in our country today where people are questioning the value of higher ed, uh, meaning right. that student loan debt is, is in the trillions of dollars. And and people are questioning, well, if I go to four years and I uh, to a university and I accumulate this debt, what do I get in return for that? So, D, I think community colleges offer students the opportunity to attend, honestly, for less than two months. To give you a quick example, we have a commercial driver's license program that trains students to be commercial drivers, uh, trucks, either in-state, out-of-state, um, intrastate. Uh, you can make $50,000 a year easily starting out 
with four weeks of training. And so, D, I think community colleges fill a gap and we offer students an opportunity, whether you want to be a commercial truck driver, a registered nurse, cybersecurity specialist, phlebotomist, x-ray technician. There's so many great careers that D, two years or less and you've got a great job opportunity ahead of you. Right. And that is a big conversation that's taking place uh, in the country because, you know, technical uh, skills and technical uh, trades are have been, I think, uh, underplayed for a lot of people. Uh, there was this time where everyone felt that you needed to have a four year degree in order to be successful. And now there's just so many different uh, trades and certifications that you can get in a fraction of the time and come out making you know more money than you could make with a four year degree in a lot of disciplines. And so I know at Southeast Arkansas College, you're, you're at the forefront of trying to uh, make those um, trades and certification and degree programs available to uh, people within the community. Uh, but before, I wanna go a little bit deeper into that, but I wanna just understand your journey um, from being an economic developer to becoming the president of Southeast Arkansas College. What was that journey uh, like for you? Yeah, so after I, I uh, had a, a successful tenure as a CEO of the, the Borger, Texas Economic Development Corporation, I missed higher ed and, and thought it was time to get back into that. So once that was done, D, I, I went to uh, um, Florida Gulf Coast University in, in Fort Myers, Florida, because I also felt like I needed to spend some time at the university level and had a, an amazing uh, tenure at Florida Gulf Coast University, learned a lot about about curriculum, learned a lot about setting up new programs, collaborating with the different colleges within the university. Um, so after uh, about five years at FGCU, an opportunity came up to become the vice president for community development at Oklahoma City Community College. So OCCC, as it's called, has about 18,000 students. It was an opportunity for me to transition from a large university to also a large community college. And so during my tenure at OCCC, I served my last two and a half years there as the executive vice president or the chief operating officer of the campus. So after about two and a half years of that, I felt like I was ready to, to ascend into the presidency. So I, I started looking at opportunities and Southeast Arkansas College was one of those that I looked at. I'd, I'd actually applied for three different positions around the country and became a finalist in two different places at once, including here and another college. But D, I felt a calling to Pine Bluff because I felt like this was a place where I needed to be. It was a place where I could help the most students and do the most good. And so that that journey to becoming a president became complete on January 3rd, 2018, when I became the president at Southeast Arkansas College. And again, it was a place where I, I felt like uh, I could come and do the most good for students. I could be an example for students about doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter that the the obstacles. There's people out there who can help you get to where you wanted to go. And D, I guess I've I've always wanted to be that person. I've always wanted to be the one to help others because that's that's when we know we're making a difference. Right. So uh, obviously, CARC is a minority serving uh, institution, and so a lot of uh, the people that are enrolled there are uh, people of color. So talk to me about. Tell me a little bit about CARC, but then also uh, mm -hmm. why serving as president of an institution that help people of, of color is so important to you. The, uh, we absolutely. So we are what's called a primarily black institution. So for CARC, that means that over 60 percent of our students are, are students of color. We have about a 20 percent uh, Hispanic Latinx population as well. So, I mean, we're a very heavily dominated minority school. And I think the reason for me being at this institution is I'm going to give you a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that that he wrote in the letter from the Birmingham jail. If you remember when Dr. King was uh, uh, in jail, he was trying to get his word out about what was going on. And of course, the internet didn't exist. Social media didn't, didn't exist. And so he wrote, one of the greatest letters of all time. And one of the lines in that letter is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And D for me, that's why I serve the students of color at our institution, because I want them to know that, that there is injustice in the world today. There's injustice in our country, but 
we're the vanguard. We're the next generation. These students are are going to be taking over when, when you and I are no longer in the positions we're in. For me, there's a special place in my heart for people who have struggled, um, people who have experienced poverty, people who have experienced housing insecurity, food insecurity. And that is the experience of many of our students. But D, as I remind our students, those insecurities don't define who you are as a person. What defines you is your ability to persevere, your ability to overcome. And so when I say being in a place where I can do the most good, um, it literally means making sure that to the extent possible, our students have a safe place to sleep at night. They they have food um, through our food pantry or other means. Um, again, just empowering somebody to realize that there's more to their world than what they can see right now. Right. And so you mentioned uh, the, the topic of food insecurity. And a lot of people don't know that more than one third of college students across the board suffer from food insecurity. And when you go to uh, minority serving institutions and HBCUs, uh, that number is staggeringly more uh, than that. And so I know that's a challenge that you, that you deal with uh, every day. So kind of elaborate on the, the food insecurity challenge that uh, your student population face, but then also some of the things you're doing to try to help uh, eliminate that. Absolutely. And, and D, you're right. Nationally, the statistics are about 33 percent of students are, are food insecure. At our, our institution, approximately more than 50 percent of our student demographic is food insecure. And one of the reasons that's so important, and I remind our faculty and staff of this all the time, is if you're enrolled in a class, it is difficult to be successful if your primary concern is either A, where's my next meal going to come from? Or B, where's my family's meal going to come from? So if I have children, if I'm caring for elder parents, if my family's food insecure, it is really difficult to focus on uh, the curriculum. It's, in, it's difficult to focus on tests. And so if we can eliminate barriers like food insecurity, um, so we've had a food pantry ever since uh, I've been at Southeast Arkansas College. We give out food to our students monthly, we have what we call brain food bags. If the student's hungry, they can pick up a bag that's got a granola bar, some fruit, some snacks, just, just to give them something to eat. Um, the other thing we're doing is, as you know, we're working on our first ever housing project, which not only is going to tackle food insecurity, but also just as big as housing insecurity. And, right. and you know, there was this characterization of college students as being, you know, these sort of, you know, being the poor, hungry college student. That's a reality for so many of our students where not only do they not know where their next meal is going to come from, but more importantly, they don't know where they're going to sleep at night, whether it's in their car, couch surfing with friends. Uh, those two things, housing and food insecurities, are such massive barriers to higher education. And you're right. We're trying to take very proactive steps to make sure that we can mitigate those circumstances to the best of our control. Right. And so I'm going to elaborate a little bit on, on uh, the housing insecurity uh, element of it as well. And, and at, at the P3 group, we're happy to be partners with CARC to help uh, address that issue. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there are a significant number of uh, homeless students uh, in college uh, and that many a lot of college students suffer from housing insecurity. And when you're serving uh, individuals that come from impoverished communities, uh, that could look a, a lot of different ways. Uh, that could look from, you know, it could be a family uh, that's living with a, you know, a relative, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, or it could also be 10 or 12 people sleeping in a uh, two bedroom house. Uh, people that are uh, sleeping on sofas, sleeping on pallets, uh, as we called it you know, when I was growing up, or, you know, or sleeping on couches, et cetera. So, uh, at CARC, uh, we partnered to bring the first ever housing uh, project to campus that's going to uh, supply uh, shelter for 171 uh, individuals. And so from a legacy perspective uh, for you, Dr. Bloomberg, uh, how do you feel that uh, development, that project would play into your legacy there at CARC? I think the most important part for me is that when you talk about legacy, so many times college presidents that have legacies that are constructed upon buildings and facilities, because obviously that 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 that's important. But but D, I think the true legacy for me is 
giving somebody the tools that they need to succeed. So again, if, if um, you're a student and you're worried about having a safe place to sleep, if I eliminate that barrier for you, then I've given you a, an additional opportunity to succeed. If I've eliminated the barrier of food service, because our housing, as you know, will have food service in it, where, where many of our students will have the most consistent meals they've ever experienced in, in their life. Right. Um, I think eliminating those barriers is what I want my legacy to be. And I want that legacy to stand upon uh, the principle that, that, again, doing the most good for everyone. And we're all in this together and helping students succeed where many times they have no idea what success even looks like. And they don't understand how to get from the point in life where they're at now to the point to where they are self-sustaining. They have opportunities for employability. They have economic mobility where they're not stuck in a dead end job. And I think D for me, the legacy is all about empowering people honestly, to do more than they ever thought possible. Right. And so, Dr. Bloomberg, we touched on just a little while ago the fact that you all have technical uh, and trade uh, certification programs that can offer uh, individuals a pathway into a career uh, that could be financially uh, rewarding without having to go the entire four years, et cetera. Uh, talk to me about some of the programs that you all have at CARC. I know we mentioned uh, the truck driving school to get your CDLs, et cetera, but what are some of the other programs and what type of uh, career opportunities do those programs offer? Great question. So D, we, if we start and we look on what we would call the nursing, nursing and allied health side, um, as you know, pre-pandemic, there was a significant shortage of, of nurses there. Since that time, obviously, there's an even larger shortage of registered nurses. So we have a great RN program that trains students to become registered nurses in two years. We have what's called a licensed practical nurse or LPN program, um, training students to become LPNs, which is just a little bit below as far as healthcare careers go, an RN um, we have a program that prepares students to be surgical technicians. So if you're in an operating room uh, to your to your viewers, surgical technicians are kind of like the right hand of the surgeon because they're the ones that have sterilized the instruments. They're the ones that are handing the doctor the actual instruments to perform surgeries. And so surgery technician is a great program uh, to get into the healthcare field as well. Um, we have respiratory care technician um, which, of course, became very prominent during the pandemic because of the significant use of ventilators and respiratory techs. And so we've had that program for a very long time. And then radiologic technology or in shorter terms, X-ray technicians. So all of these programs, D, train students to become industry certified um, after a two year educational career. And as you know, registered nurses are in such demand that that there are hiring bonuses, there are sign-on bonuses, there, there are great opportunities for hourly rates. So many nurses just starting out are well above the $50,000 uh, mark. X-ray technicians, respiratory care, all of these are, are career fields, D, that start out again um, as a new entrant into the workforce, uh, $50,000 or more a year. So Nursing Allied Health plays a really big, vital part of our curriculum at Southeast Arkansas College. So, Dr. Bloomberg, obviously, in order to be successful at the higher education level, uh, it's not just the president, right? It's, it has to be the staff and the supporting cast that make all of that possible. Just talk to uh, us briefly about your supporting uh, cast members there and how they have helped you succeed at, at CARC. I tell our staff and faculty all the time that I'm I'm humbled by what they do. And and in our business, one thing above all, if you're going to work in higher ed, is so important. And that's having a passion to serve, um, having a passion to serve students. And D, unequivocally, our faculty and staff are united in their desire to serve. And so that means that people go the extra mile. If a student has missed a class, you know, professors reach out and say, hey, D, are, are you okay? What's what's going on? Um, our Student Success Center that, that helps advise students intervenes if a student is not doing well in a class or or not performing well on a, on a test. Uh, it takes so many people to make sure that a student has a successful conclusion to their journey. So D, from our faculty to all of our support staff, honestly, 
to our institutional services, our custodians, our groundskeepers, um, our college campus is immaculate because we have people who care about it, who take care of it. And again, for many of our students, I know this sounds like like it's over dramatized, but when you arrive somewhere and the buildings are clean, they smell good. The grass is cut. The grass is mowed. There's people who greet you with a smile. That makes such a difference, particularly if you're coming from somewhere where nobody's smiling or maybe the grass hasn't been cut or whatever the case may be. Having a supportive learning environment aesthetically is important, but having the right people in place, both in the classroom and outside the classroom, are so incredibly important. And D, without the team we have here at this institution, we couldn't do the great things we do for our students. No, no question about it. Dr. Bloomberg, I, I couldn't have summed it up better. Uh, it's been great having you on the show. I think that we are very impressed with what, the work you're doing at, at, at CARC. Uh, to my viewers, I want to thank you for watching this episode of Self Made. I'm your host, D Brown, CEO. And remember, without you, there's no me.